Good morning, everyone. Hello and welcome. I'm Warren Call, the President and CEO of Travers Connect. On behalf of our Board of Directors and our staff, thank you for joining us today for this economic strategy session. This is the third and final in our series this year. The economic strategy sessions are an initiative by Travers Connect to engage high-level investors and community leaders with the key pillars of our strategic plan and to provide clear and transparent leadership and guidelines for our region's economic development activity. Held three times annually, the economic strategy sessions focuses on our core strategy for Travers Connect's economic development leadership. In 2020, our focus is on our talent initiative. A strategic priority for Travers Connect is to broaden our talent attraction and our development program to help diversify and rebuild a resilient regional economy and get you, our businesses and organizations, the staff you need to grow and succeed. A vibrant cultural and creative community attracts talent to this region. It enhances the economy and places our region on the map as a desirable place to live. The goal of this session is to demonstrate best practices and guidelines for enhancing our region's creative economy and ways to effectively highlight the importance of upholding existing artistic and cultural institutions in our local economy to grow jobs and to attract talent to our region. On today's agenda, we're very happy to have Randy Cohen as our keynote speaker, who we're excited to introduce in just a, a little bit. We'll have time for Q&A with him at the end of the event as well. To submit your questions, please type your questions into the comment section of YouTube. You must be logged into Google or a YouTube account in order to post questions. So please post those now and throughout the event. But before we kick off with our keynote speaker, I'd like to first acknowledge and thank our important sponsors for supporting this event. Thank you first and foremost to our presenting sponsor, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan. Let me now welcome Chris Dobb from Blue Cross. Tom from Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Michigan here in Traverse City. We're excited to be a sponsor of today's event. And I'm looking forward to talking to you a little bit about a couple things before we get started. Um, the most important thing I wanted to mention this day is that it is Suicide Prevention Month. Many of you are probably aware of that and we're looking for every opportunity we can to help people, right? All of us. So one of the things that the Chamber does and offers is uh, an employee assistance pro program sponsored by Blue Cross and Blue Shield, but it is a chamber program. It's an excellent chamber program that comes at a very good cost, and it is a full service program that provides several benefits that, that aren't necessarily be available from other products, um, and it is something definitely to consider. And in this time of COVID and looking for ways to get stronger, to stay strong through this process. Uh, this might be a good option to consider. And if you're interested, you can contact me, Chris Staub at cstaub at bcbsm.com, or you can contact Travers Connect and they will get you to the right person to explore this option. So anyway, it's good to be here. I hope um, that you all enjoy the event and the time today. And, um, I'm glad to be a part of this and I will turn it back over uh, now to get started with the process. Thank you, Chris. And thank you to Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan for your ongoing and very strong support for our programs and events. I'd like to now thank Munson Healthcare for their generous support as a supporting sponsor. Let's hear from Matt Willey and Munson Healthcare. Hello, I'm Matt Willey, President and CEO of Munson Medical Center. We are proud to serve as a sponsor for today's economic strategy session focused on attracting talent, which is so vital to the strength and growth of our community. The business environment being fostered by Traverse Connect and the quality of life in the region provides us with the opportunity to attract the best and brightest, including Dr. Gary Raja, who is helping to expand the neuroscience and stroke program at Munson Medical Center and providing critical care right here in our region when minutes truly matter. We are grateful to Traverse Connect for their support and leadership in the business community, 
particularly their role in helping to safely navigate these last six months through the pandemic. Thank you for participating in today's virtual event and enjoy the presentation. Thank you, Matt, and thanks once again to Munson Healthcare. I'd like to also acknowledge the support of the Michigan Film and Digital Media Office, part of the MEDC, without whom this event would not be possible. So thank you to them, as well as, and finally, the Northwest Michigan Arts and Cultural Network is our media sponsor for this event. So thanks again to that organization as well. It's now my pleasure to get to the main event and introduce our keynote speaker, Randy Cohen. So let me first start with Randy's impressive bio. Randy Cohen is Vice President of Research at Americans for the Arts, the National Advocacy Organization for the Arts, where he has been empowering arts advocates since 1991. He publishes Americans Speak Out About the Arts, a national public opinion study about the arts, as well as the two premier economic studies of the arts, Arts and Economic Prosperity, the National Impact Study of Nonprofit Arts Organizations and Their Audiences, as well as Creative Industries, a mapping study of the nation's 675,000 arts businesses and their employees. His 10 Reasons to Support the Arts blog received the Gold Award from the Association of Media and Publishing, their top honor for best blog post of the year. Randy led the development of the National Arts Policy Roundtable, an annual convening of leaders who focus on the advancement of American culture, launched in partnership with Robert Redford and the Sundance Institute. A sought after speaker, Randy has given speeches in all 50 states and regularly appears in the news media, including the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, and on C-SPAN, CNN, CNBC, and NPR. Randy, thank you for joining us today. Please take it away. Warren, and hello, everybody. Thank you so much. It's great uh, to be with you all today. And uh, I'm, I'm just so honored to be part of this program. Um, you know, it's the perfect topic. Uh, you know, economic strategy sessions and uh, recruiting and attracting talent and the arts, uh, because that's um, that's the name of the game these days, right? Uh, you know, how do you prosper in a global economy? It's creativity, it's innovation. And as you're going to hear, uh, the arts have a big role in that, not just um, as an industry. And the arts are a bigger industry than most people think, um, but as a way to drive creativity, drive innovation, and again, bring those people we're looking for to town uh, to work where we're at. Um, certainly the COVID-19, here I am, week uh, 28 working at home. Um, well, I could be anywhere these days. Uh, I think it's been a real accelerator process, uh, you know, these past six months. So uh, the game has completely changed. And I know you all know that. Um, so uh, I'm going to just jump right into it. We're going to talk about the arts. We're going to talk about uh, its impact on the economy. Um, and uh, but before we do, you know, I always like to remind people about the, uh, you know, the fundamental reason for the arts. Um, and so what I'm showing you here is a uh, flute found in a cave by some anthropologists in Germany a couple of years ago. Um, and it's a hand carved flute uh, made out of animal bone. And they've actually dated this to be 35,000 years years old, a 35,000 year old hand carved flute. Um, and you can see it's a beautiful piece all on its own. And eventually someone got the guts. Well, I, I guess we should blow some air through it. Here you do it, you know, and they kind of you know, had some nice tonality to it. Um, but what was interesting in reading this paper, and it was published in the journal Nature, top scientific uh, uh, journal in the world. Um, these anthropologists were trying to figure out now what was the purpose of this flute? Hmm. You know, they thought, well, maybe it was to help promote territorial expansion uh, or a way to uh, celebrate the hunt, maybe related to the fertility ritual. I kept thinking, maybe they liked the way it sounded. That never showed up. But, uh, you know, the arts uh, and music um, have been a real organizing uh, 
part of our communities since the cave days. I, and in fact, it was actually just this week, 80 years ago, um, that four teenagers looking for their lost dog um, landed themselves in the caves of, caves of Lascaux, uh, which many of you probably heard of in France. Um, 2,000 paintings and uh, all kinds of work on the walls, on the ceiling. Um, and it was a real central part of uh, a people's way of life then. So um, arts and culture central to who we are as an individual, to a society, have been for a long time. Um, I don't know if there's any flute players in the group, but uh, fast forward uh, 35,000 years to the uh, 1500s, um, where we find the shame flute. Yeah, the sh flute's still in business, but uh, this little ditty, uh, which you can uh, see on the right, made out of cast iron, it, it's clasped around a person's neck, the fingers are shackled to that long iron tube. The purpose of the shame flute was to punish bad musicians. Yeah, that's right. You got a gig at the Prince's Palace and you stank up the joint while well, they'd march around town for a couple of days in the shame flute so everybody could laugh at the bad musician. Um, you know, sounds a little barbaric, but uh, uh, hey, they cared about their music. And you can actually find this, uh, in fact, um, this picture uh, and the uh, flute in the Museum of Crime and Punishment, which is where else but just down the road for me in Washington, D.C. Anyway, so that's just by background, arts, culture, part of who we are, not just a frill, not just an extra, but central to us as people. Um, uh, Warren mentioned in my uh, inter uh, kind introduction, uh, we do the largest public opinion survey of the arts out there every couple of years. And one of the things um, that we find is that 90%, nine out of 10 Americans say the arts are uh, important to our quality of life. Uh, and this starts to get into, you know, creating these culturally vibrant communities, these places we want to live. The public gets it. But what's also interesting, and this always fascinates me, and this is a number that's popped up several times, 86% also agree that the arts, arts institutions, theaters, museums are important to local businesses and important to the local economy. So let's explore that a little bit. Um, how do we, what does this mean? Strengthening the economy through the arts? The arts are an industry and they're in a bigger industry than uh, just about anybody really thinks about. And I give you as evidence of that. Um, every year now, the U.S. Bureau of Economic Analysis, top economic shop over at Department of Commerce, uh, they do something called the Arts and Cultural Production Satellite Account. And big national study, essentially they, you know, they take the entire economy and dump it on a table and pull out every single arts dollar that they can find, you know? So it's it's your nonprofit theaters, museums, ballet, arts education organizations, but it's also your individual artists. It's Broadway, it's the motion picture industry, it's music instrument manufacturing, it's the university drama and dance department, anywhere where they can find, um, you know, uh, a, a transaction, uh, that's, they, they, they add that up. And what they found, 2017, most current year of data, uh, arts and culture is an $878 billion industry in this country. Billion with a B. Um, and that is 4.5% of the nation's GDP. That's a bigger share of the economy than agriculture, transportation, tourism, lion size industries. Uh, and yet, here's arts and culture when you add it all up, even larger than those. Now, what's great is um, they now drill down to a state level. Uh, we're not down to the local level yet. And uh, certainly, you know, we look forward to that day. But um, in Michigan, arts and culture, a $13.9 billion industry. That's 2.8% of gross state product, 2.8% of your state's economy. What does that do to the you know, bottom line we're looking at? Jobs. It's a jobs industry, 121,332 jobs um, uh, supported by the arts. Uh, and... That's a big number. Uh, if, uh, you know, if, if I was with you, and man, I wish I was. I wish we were all in the same room, but uh, we'll get to do that again one of these days. Uh, you know, show of hands. Who would have thought it was even half of that? Um, and 
in fact, the, at the Bureau of Economic Analysis, when they first created this, uh, you know, a number of years back, um, you know, they did all the analysis and methodology and looked at all the different art sectors and sub art sectors. And, and then they kind of, you know, presented their uh, first take on it. And everybody at PEA was like, what? No way, man. Way too big. That that can't be right. They're like, all right, well, you know, uh, we're just a bunch of economic scholars and analysts and we'll put it out for public comment. We'll get lots of feedback. And they took all that and put them in a room with a pot of coffee. Slam, don't come out till you get it right. Uh, they re-ran it, they redeveloped. And the numbers came out even bigger. Uh, and that really turned a lot of heads at Commerce. Um, and uh, again, to the, our reason for being together today, BEA doesn't even do one of these satellite accounts unless it's got a really important role in the economy. And how do you prosper in a global economy? Creativity, innovation, new products, optimizing existing products. It takes creativity to do that. And there's a big link to the arts. And so that's just the fact that they do this is an acknowledgement of why we're here today. Um, Drilling down a little bit uh, to the nonprofit arts and culture sector. And, you know, I think a lot of times when we think of supporting the arts, you know, whether it's through our business contributions, whether it's government's uh, investment in the arts, um, it's that nonprofit sector. You know, it's that's your museums, your symphonies, your operas, your arts education organizations. And so um, we look to see, well, what's the impact of that on a community? And, and that's an appropriate question, right? You know, uh, uh, everybody gets that the arts provide cultural events, but what else is the public getting for that investment? What's the ROI? What are some of those economic benefits? Because that's just how we're measuring things these days, right? Well, I'll just give you some national snapshot data. Nationally, nonprofit arts and culture, $166.3 billion industry. And you can see that's comprised of two figures. On the left, you got spending by the arts organizations themselves. That right there is a myth buster. Arts organizations are businesses. They employ people locally, purchase goods and services from other neighboring businesses. They're members of the chamber. They help drive tourism. Arts organizations are good business citizens. And then they leverage, and this is the audience spending piece, all this event related spending which is going to local businesses so think about the last time you went out to an arts event you know did you like get in the car drive there go see the show get in the car drive home probably not right dinner and a show hey maybe you paid for parking had dinner saw the show or the exhibit exhibition and went out for dessert or drinks after the show and came home and doubled the cost of the evening on babysitting i think the real racket and all of this um Arts audiences spend a lot of money related uh, to the events that they're attending, dollars that are going to local businesses. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Um, but what's the economic impact of this $166 billion? Um, jobs. You know, uh, ask any elected leader what their three priorities are, and they'll tell you jobs, jobs, and jobs. All right, well, you know what? If this is what our legislators uh, care about, let's connect that priority to the arts and cultural product. Nationally, 4.6 million jobs supported by the arts industry. Now, arts organizations do more than hire just uh, curators and actors and designers and wig makers. Um, they've got accountants and auditors. They got marketing people and uh, you know finance folks. You ever know when you go to an arts event, they're always giving you a, you know a piece of paper, a program, a flyer, something like that. Well, there's a writer in the community that was paid to write that. Um, and there's a graphic artist that was paid to design that piece. Printers, you know, you got to print all that stuff. Um, printers do great by the arts because it's always all, you know, full color and, uh, uh, and thousands and thousands of copies of it. And there's a trucking delivery company that drops the programs off every week. So even something as simple as the theater program um, touches industries throughout the community. Uh, so bottom line, arts, not just food for the soul, but putting food on the table for 4.6 million households. What's something else we look at? Government revenue. 
you know, if you look at all government funding of the arts, federal, state, local, uh, you know, it's five to six billion dollars. Um, total government return on that, um, $27.5 billion. Uh, small investment, big return. That's the arts. And what this shows is that when we support the arts, those dollars aren't just swirling down some black hole of goodness you know no it's it's giving obviously cultural events but it's also returning uh these economic benefits to the community now let's get to where this really starts to get interesting um and that's that event related spending by arts audiences as part of this national study arts and economic prosperity six we did two hundred and twelve thousand audience intercept surveys. We were in uh, all 50 states, communities as small as 1,400 people, as large as 4 million people. Doesn't matter, you know, if, where you are, if the arts are happening there, there is going to be a measurable uh, economic impact. And same with the audience spending in all of those communities. The typical attendee spends $31.47 per person per event not including the cost of admission. And you can see in this pie chart here how those dollars break out. And that's a pretty typical ratio. And, you know, some communities are less, you know, some communities are more, your your mileage may differ. Um, and, uh, uh, but you can see there's food and transportation and so you might be looking at lodging, you know, wow, can you still get a room here, you know, for $4.48? No, it's a percentage. Uh, it's an average, you know, and not everybody has a lodging cost. So remember, these are averages. Uh, other is always interesting. You know, you're, you're always going to get some interesting other responses with 212,000 interviews. Um, I was actually uh, talking to the uh, folks in Wisconsin uh, not long ago, where um, in one of the communities that we studied there, uh, uh, there was a farmer who paid somebody $60 to milk his cows so he could go to the theater that night. Isn't that great? People are doing what it takes to get to the arts. So in addition to asking all these attendees how much they spent related to this arts event at local businesses, we asked them another question, and that was for their zip code. So we wanted to find out, do they live in the county in which the arts event took place, which would make them local? Are they from outside the county? When I get at this whole cultural tourism notion, well, 34% of attendees come from outside the county in which the arts event took place. And they average about $48 per person per event, not including the cost of admission. And we actually asked them one more question on top of that, because we're just that annoying. And that was, why are you here? Um, you're here on business, you're here visiting friends and family, 69% uh, said we came specifically for this arts event. Um, and so you could see, you know, the pulling power that the arts have. And so when we when we support the arts, we're not investing in a frill or an extra, you know, we're investing in an industry, it supports jobs, generates uh, and, you know, it helps drive tourism. So that's that's our nonprofit sector uh, and a vibrant nonprofit sector has the purpose um, really to connect with everyone in the community. And that's one of the reasons. Um, it needs our support uh, and uh, our participation, our sponsorship, um, our patronage, you know, just keep going is something else we could do. So let me uh, uh, move now a little bit more to some of the uh, uh, innovation and creativity and workforce um, part of the uh, conversation. And what you're looking at here is a World War II tank. Um, well, it's a World War II era image of a tank. In fact, um, it is uh, an inflatable tank. Um, and I know how many of you maybe have heard of uh, uh, the 23rd Special Troops Unit uh, in World War II, um, the Ghost Army. Um, so if you turn back the clock uh, to World War II and the battle in Europe, it was real touch and go. Uh, <laughs> folks weren't really sure how this was going to work out. The military was looking to get any kind of advantage that they could. And so one of them thought, you know, if there's some way to um, confound the enemy a little bit, you know, throw them off the scent, that might help. You know, that might give us just a slight edge. And so what they did is 
they looked to the arts and they looked to artists to come up with some kind of creative, crafty scheme uh, to help meet those goals and objectives. And so they went to the art schools. They pulled out artists and designers and technicians and craftsmen. And they uh, the, uh, the Ghost Army did um, uh, over 20 um, battlefield diversions and some were big and some were smaller you know sometimes they had a, you know some actors in a in a local bar known to be a restaurant to be frequented by enemy spies and uh you know they were all in full military officer uniform and maybe just looking like they had a little too much to drink and speaking maybe just a little too loud about you know when Patton goes south there's going to be trouble you know knowing that there was uh, lots of little leaders listening to what was going on there um one of the uh, U.S. generals credits uh, the 23rd Special Troops Unit um, with saving 10,000 American lives uh, during a Rhine War battle because um, it peeled off this huge portion of the German tanks uh, who went to uh, the German um, uh, uh, military who went to chase down the inflatable tanks. Um, so uh, Ellsworth Kelly, Art Kane, Bill Blast, the fashion and designer. So many of our World War II era artists were uh, members of the 23rd. So, you know, great story there. And the bottom line is, uh, if we can use arts and creativity uh, to help us succeed in a World War II battlefield, well, you know, we sure can do it here in town, right? So um, it's kind of a fun story there. So what is, uh, you know, what is our arts community looking like? And, you know, how much is there there? And so um, this is a study I do, Creative Industries, Business and Employment in the Arts. And I use Dun & Bradstreet data uh, to determine how many arts businesses and how many people do they employ uh, in geographic and political regions across the country. Uh, so here we could see, you know, the county, I can get down to a county level and uh, um, 340 arts businesses uh, in Grand Traverse County uh, that employ um, almost 1,500 people. And each of those little dots represents a business. And it's nice you can sort of see them spread out, um, you know, across, uh, across the county. And these are nonprofit theaters, museums, ballet companies, but also for-profit commercial, art galleries, film, uh, you know, individual artists, uh, if they're, into, you know, uh, incorporated as businesses. So um, there's a good presence there. And then we can also calculate what share of local businesses and what share of employment that is. And so you can see on the lower left there, 4.9% of the businesses in the county are arts-centric businesses, businesses involved in the creation or the distribution of the arts. Um, nationally, 673,000 arts businesses. Um, that's 4% of the business establishment. So we're actually running we're running ahead of the curve here. Uh, and so that's that's great news. Uh, clearly things are moving uh, you know, in the right direction here. We take a very conservative approach. You know, these are uh, people that creative industries and obviously creativity is ubiquitous, right? So again, these are just arts businesses. There's no computer programmers or medical researchers. Um, uh, I was uh, presenting these data to some economists not long ago, and one of them asked me, um, did you include morticians, you know, as part of your universe? And I was like, uh no, but bring it. Maybe I'm missing something here. And he said, well, aren't morticians actually involved as presenters of the body um, and using lighting and makeup and, you know, a new suit, costuming? You know, he never looked as good alive as he does today. Um, no, no morticians in these data. So these are just arts businesses. Uh, so you can feel, you know, very solid about this. And again, Lots to work with, lots to build on already right here in the county. Um, now, the importance of creativity uh, is um, reflected in a lot of different research studies. Um, the Department of Agriculture, U.S. Department of Agriculture, uh, does a lot of work. Um, I've just been working uh, with some of their data on rural communities. And um, 
Two out of three business leaders in rural communities say arts and culture is important to helping us uh, attract talent. In fact, I watched the uh, economic strategy session, um, the last one with uh, Aaron and Laurel, and they were they talked about. Um, you know, they were, I mean, their topic, as you all know, was sort of uh, the uh, remote working and everything. But in terms of tr uh, attracting workforce, um, arts and culture, pretty much second only to high speed internet. You know, if we can't get online these days, you know, which is a huge issue, you know, in a lot of smaller communities or uh, rural communities. So, um, obviously, we've got a big crowd here today. So, access is there. But after that, arts and culture. What am I going to do if I move there? What's my, you know, family going to do? What are my kids going to do if we move uh, to a community? And, uh, you know, this has um, real world ramifications. And so uh, I was down in this a couple of years ago down in Houston. I was speaking to the Greater Houston Partnership an organization similar to this one is kind of part chamber of commerce, part economic development organization. And there was about 40 of their business leaders uh, board uh, members and you know they wanted to hear the connection between arts and the economy and there's one guy sort of sitting in the back arms crossed shoulders hunched over <laughs> you know and I remember I thought okay I got that's the guy I got to get to right there um, after you know sharing some of the earlier data that I just shared with you data from the BEA analyses of Dun and Bradstreet data um, you know audience uh, and economic development data um, you know. It, shoulders came down a bit he dropped his arms and eventually kind of cleared his throat and everybody like made space for him and he said well you know governor perry did just say in a speech that the reason we lost the boeing headquarters to chicago is because we couldn't keep up culturally i thought oh my god please let this be true and in fact um you can go online you can google it search governor perry boeing relocation you know arts vitality and he says in a speech in his prepared remarks that um the dfw area dallas fort worth area was one of the finalists uh and um for boeing's relocation and boeing told him you know what uh arts a vibrant arts and culture community is key for us to attracting top executive talent and their families dfw area is really good but chicago's chicago um so this this has uh, consequence. This has opportunity. Um, and uh, so I want to share a report because there's numbers that underscore all this as well. So this is a, a study um, done by the conference board. And I'm sure many of you are familiar with the conference board. They're the national organization for big business in this country. And, you know, um, and their research shows that creativity is now among the top five applied skills that business leaders are looking for. Uh, in fact, it's leapfrog the three R's, reading, writing, arithmetic, you know. Um, as researchers, we talk about it. Well, of course, you got to be able to read, write, and do math. But if you can apply some creativity to your scientific, your agriculture, your medical research uh, work, those are the that's where innovation happens those are the high paying jobs we're all looking to attract uh to our communities um 72 percent of business leaders in this study say creativity um is of high importance in hiring 85 percent of those folks say can't find the people we're looking for so you know there's no typing test for creativity we get that so um they asked them all right business leaders across the country. How do you know if you got to, you know, you cast the hook out? How do you know if you got a creative worker across the table from you? And the biggest indicators of creativity, and there were two way at the top, starting your own company, so entrepreneurial activity and study of the arts, especially while in college. And uh, we've had, a, you know, for a long time, a banker um, uh, on our board of directors, uh, Ken Ferguson down in Oklahoma. Um, and uh he's former chair of the american banking association so i mean he's he's all in the bank world big time and um 
And he tells us that uh, when I'm interviewing somebody, I'm always asking them, you know, I want to ask about their involvement in the arts uh, as maker, as a tender, because it opens up a conversation. And for him, it becomes a, an important proxy for creativity and innovation. Oh, he'll say, except for my bank tellers. I don't want creative bank tellers, but uh, everybody else, we need, you know, people thinking creatively and looking for fresh uh, new solutions. Um, the conclusion of this report, uh, they write, you know, this is business scholars writing for business leaders. It's clear that the arts, music, drawing, drama, dance, literature, media, you know, provide skills sought by employers of the third millennium. This also then starts to connect. So this is, you know, what we as business leaders are looking for. But you know what? The workforce is looking to become more engaged uh, in creativity. Um, you know, and they tell us, you know, I mean, I speak up till six months ago. I was in a different city every week, you know, and I was in a lot of cities where, uh, whether it's Columbus or Boise or Muncie or Lubbock, um, you know, cities big and small, big ones, San Francisco, Miami, even cities like that, everyone's paying attention. How do we attract and retain workers? How do we get them here? And the workers, you know, so this is what uh, HRVPs are asking them, right? What'll bring you here? What'll get you to stay here? Um, and the answers that are usually always up at the top are like, look, you want me to be creative and innovative in the workplace. I'm a creative and innovative person. I need creativity and arts and culture in my life. And so that's, you know, um, that's where these workers are gravitating to. And it doesn't have to be in a, you know, a big city anymore. And so that's what the competition's doing. And we'll talk about some strategies, some ways to create this culturally vibrant community um, that, you know, that that's a draw there. Uh, but this is important research. And again, just really emphasizing uh, the importance of, um, of creativity. And, um, our jobs are more and more uh, requiring creativity. So back to my big national public opinion study, 55% of employed Americans, we only asked the people who are employed, um, said their, uh, their jobs require them to be, create, uh, to be creative. And 60% said, the more creative I am in the workplace, the more successful I am. So this is just coming at us from all different directions. And here's what this looks like in motion, you know, in, in action. This happy looking fella, Thomas Sudoff, got from Stanford University, a medical researcher, 2013 got the Nobel Prize um, uh, for medicine. And the, you know, media called him up, Professor, congratulations. Who is your most inspirational teacher? They asked him. And without missing a beat, he said, I owe it all to my bassoon teacher. And he went on to describe how it was his music education that gave him the habits of mind uh, that made him a great scientist. Perseverance, drive for excellence, not just stopping at the first solution, but, you know, pursuing multiple solutions to problems. Um, and the research shows that uh, that may not be some freak example. Um, right there in uh, down in Michigan um, State, uh, there's a scholar, um, Robert Root Bernstein, Root hyphen Bernstein, who's um, studied creativity uh, for his his career. That's been his, you know, his MacArthur Genius Award winner and all that kind of stuff. Well, one of the things he and his team did is they studied all the Nobel laureates in the sciences going back to the beginning. And he looked at their level of arts involvement. You know, are they a musician? Are they, uh, you know, a poet? Are they a painter? And then he compared them to scientists at two prominent uh, scientific societies, one in the US, one in the UK. What he found, the Nobel laureates, 17 times more likely uh, to be active arts maker, um, you know, so correlation, but you know, there's really something there, you know, about the importance of, of creativity and learning to be creative. And this really, um, gets us to the, uh, a point of, um, starting our, our, with our kids, getting people um, young uh, and arts and making sure the arts are part of education. And, and the research is so powerful. Uh, when a young person um, has the arts as uh, part of their education, they're performing better academically, better grades, better test scores, uh, lower dropout rates even. There's a um, was a UC, uh, UCLA researcher, uh, uh, 
James Catterall, who studied longitudinal data, 25,000 students from 1,000 schools across the country. It was Department of Education data. And what he did to kind of get at some of these findings, there's a lot of studies, but I, I think this is just a really fascinating one, is um, he looked at those 25,000 students and he put them into four groups, four quartiles, based on their level of arts involvement. Um, so, you know, up here at the top, practices violin three hours a day, you know, that type of thing. And it kind of worked his way down here, the lowest quartile, maybe, you know, goes to the museum once a year, that's it, something like that. And he compared the academic performance between the most arts involved and the least arts involved kids. And what he found, again, is um, the arts involved students performing better academically, the grades, the test scores, the lower dropout rates. Now, I'm sure many of you are thinking what he thought, you know, before he even published, like, well, yeah, but aren't these kids probably from better educated and more affluent families? And we'd expect them to do better, right? So what he did is he went back to his um, 25,000 students, the base, and then looked just at the lowest socioeconomic quartile. Um, so your low income communities, your Title I schools, and he did the same analysis. And what he found is not only did those results hold, but there was an even greater disparity between the arts involved and the non-arts involved kids, helping researchers then think, wow, maybe the arts help level the playing field or kids who got a late start to catch up. Uh, so a lot of really important research that shows um, kids, you know, are, are need the arts uh and they're doing better with the arts um i gotta tell you i was one of those kids in elementary school where you know the most interesting thing going on was like whatever was outside that window uh and i'm really grateful you know i guess that's what helped part pull me into this is you know the arts and drama really kind of gave me some reasons for some purpose for coming back to school um and of course, now with so many kids doing remote learning, uh, a lot of schools are trying to figure out, all right, well, um, what's going to engage these kids, you know, and get them to my wife's downstairs right now. She's a library media specialist teaching it all online, you know, pre-K through uh, fifth grade. And um, how do you attract these kids and get them to turn their camera on and sit up and pay attention and participate? Uh, you know, and once again, you know, it's just the arts uh, connecting kids bringing them into the process. Um, I just want to talk about one more area, um, you know, that's important to our communities. And, and what you can start to see here I'm doing is pulling all the big issues right off the front page and connecting them to the arts, right? Education, jobs, the economy, well, healthcare, and, you know, and uh, we're so grateful uh, uh, to Chris and Blue Cross Blue Shield, uh, speaking of healthcare, uh, you know, for um, being, you know, having us be here today. Um, but the arts even have healthcare benefits. So um, I've got an arts background. I also have a medical research background. I worked at Stanford University, Scripps Clinic and Research Foundation. And when I worked at Scripps down uh, back in my California days, um, every Tuesday at three o'clock, we used to have live chamber music in the lobby. Uh, and um, it was wonderful. You know, four musicians would just completely transform the environment uh, and patients would walk in or they'd be wheeled in and their family could come with them and um, staff could be there. Uh, I knew more doctors that would have three to four on Tuesdays as their chart review hour, but there they were with a chair listening to the chamber music. Um, but what we started to notice is a transformation that would happen in patients. Patients that I would see in their rooms clinically, lethargic, depressed, Hey, we've all been in the hospital. Nobody wants to be there, right? But in the presence of the music, you could see physical changes. People's eyes got less cloudy. Their posture got better. And he just sort of sensed a greater awareness of the environment around them. And we all looked at this like something's happening here. You know, it's it's like they're getting an IV, IV drip of the arts or, or something. And, you know, and now there's this growing body of evidence and research that shows when the arts are part of our healing, they're part of our health care, shorter hospital stays, fewer doctor visits, less medication, less depression, even evidence that it saves money. Um, I'll give you an example. We got time. Uh, Tallahassee, Florida, where I was 
back again, but when we could travel. Um, the hospital there was dealing with the issue of pediatric CAT scans. Um, and you know, or maybe you might be familiar with this big noisy machines uh, that's claustrophobic. You got squirmy kids, uh, you know, kids, they have a high retest rate. They, you know, they, they mess it up. The, they mess up the test a lot of times. And it ties up the machine. It costs a lot of money. So what happens is a lot of times these kids are sedated, sometimes a general anesthetic because you got to get the picture, right? Um, and they thought, you know, is there a better way to, you know, not have to give these kids so much medicine. And so they decided to try a music intervention. And so an hour before the procedure, um, they brought in a guitarist or a harpist. They gave the kids a little something to relax. But um, the musician sat with the child, played music, talked, reduced the stress and anxiety of this situation. And that worked to the tune of a 98% procedural success rate and saved an average of about $560 per procedure. So, you know, wins all around, right? So one more way that the arts, uh, you know, are, 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 are creating these more creative, livable uh, communities. And the arts make us feel creative. So what do we do here, right? You know, um, when we ask people who attend the arts or arts makers, um, why and you know um you know does it inspire you or remind you of a time and a place you know we give people a bunch of reasons but the first pass through on the survey i only let them pick one and the number one reason is makes me feel creative and what we see now is that about half just shy of half of americans are actually hands-on arts makers of some kind. You know, there's 275,000 choirs in this country with, uh, you know, 32 million people singing in them. You know, people taking a ceramics class or a painting class. Um, you know, we can, t you know, playing guitar at home. I mean, there's a lot of things, a lot of ways we can engage in the arts. You know, we don't have to be singing on a stage at the Met in order to say, yeah, I'm doing that. And if you actually look at this bottom picture, um, this is one of my favorite uh, programs, these bottom two. It's called the Rusty Musicians Project. And it's, a, uh, it's um, from the Baltimore Symphony. And, you know, they were looking at their audience like, gosh, it's shrinking, you know, it's aging. How do we engage people? If all these people are personally involved in the arts, how do we get them here? You know, put some cheeks in the seats. Uh, and, um, and so what they did is they put out a call to the community that said, if you're proficient in a musical instrument and you can read music, you can perform in a live uh uh, symphony concert with the Baltimore Orchestra. You know, they kind of cross their fingers, please God, somebody call. Within 24 hours, they had 400 people sign up. They had 700 people before it was all over. You know, they had to like stretch these concerts, uh, you know, throughout the year. Um, I always like to joke, you know, if you look at sort of the serious faces where this is the smiling faces, I can think you can see which ones are the regular musicians and which ones are the ones that are like, this is great. It's what I've always wanted to do. I've got Got some job, but this is my avocation, and people are looking to participate and engage, and um, and so that's a question, you know, as we start to think about strategies, uh, you know, for what can we do in the you know Traverse area and the region? Um, are there arts maker spaces? Are you know half the population people want to create? It makes them feel creative. What kind of opportunities are we providing for that? Um, are there different ways to engage in the arts? So here's another local one for me. You know, we're based in the D.C. area. Uh, so a couple of years ago, the Washington National Opera went out of business. Placido Domingo is its artistic director. Uh, ticket sales down, revenues down. Finally couldn't make a go of it anymore. Um, they kind of dissolved and became a program of the Kennedy Center. So I guess Washingtonians maybe just don't like opera anymore. Well, maybe or maybe not, because Every summer, probably except this summer, um, we have something called Opera in the Outfield at our baseball stadium. And they do a live simulcast on the big screen of an opera. 20,000 people show up to that. You know, you can picnic on the grass. You could sit in the stands in the bleachers. You know, the concessions are open. Really, 
Wouldn't you rather have a chili dog and a beer while you watch the opera? I mean, you know, that sounds like so ultra civilized to me. Um, so the problem's not opera. Opera's in great shape. Um, but how people start to consume the arts is something we see changing. Um, that national survey I do, I talked about, 72% of the American public said, yeah, I went to an arts event last year. You know, I gave them a list to check, and 72% of them checked at least one of those. Um, sort of the traditional places to go or, you know, visual performing arts to experience the arts. But I followed that up with another question, which was, you know, there's a lot of places to have an arts experience. You know, in the last year, did you have an arts experience? Um, you know, a symphony in the park or in the hospital or public art in the built environment. Um, and 70%. So almost the same amount said, oh, yeah, you know, I've, I've seen the arts in other places. And so lots of demand for that. And here's some interesting examples. And again, where we're going on this is, okay, if we're looking to attract these 20, this 21st century workforce, um, you know, these creative and innovative workers uh, to work for our local businesses, because here's the thing, um, these days the businesses are following the employees, right? And if you've got the workforce there, um, you know, it uh, doesn't matter if it's Madrid or Michigan, people are going to go where they can find the workers. And so how do you create this creative, um, vibrant community? Well, you know, these are just some trips from the last, you know, couple of years. This is one of my favorite, just down the road there in Kansas City. Um, they built a new public library uh, there, and it's a beautiful building with beautiful glass architecture and woods and all that stuff. And um, it's really tremendous. It's right downtown. And it's got a couple story parking lot, right? Because you got to get down there and park. Well, you had this beautiful architecture right next to a parking structure. They thought, you know, is there something we can do with that? And so what they did is a public process where they asked the community, what are your most, what are your favorite books, your most, you know, best reads from over the years? And they came up with a list of 21. And then they had um, public artists create these three story tall mylar screens of book spines. And so what you're looking at are 20 to 30 foot tall book spine. So it looks like this one block long library bookshelf. Now, you know, you spend millions of dollars on the parking lot. You know, this project was a couple hundred thousand bucks. Um, and talking to, uh, you know, friends at Hallmark, um, it's not just a delight for locals. It's actually got um, international attention. Uh, again, a colleague of mine at Hallmark says, you know, um, I've had people tell me on the way to back to the airport, can we stop by uh, and see the library parking lot? I want to hear about this, see this one block long bookshelf. Um, Here's a, a program we see in a number of communities. Um, you know, it's like, hey, we're a music city, the music on hold program. Uh, and this was in, uh, uh, you can get, see it in Boston, Austin, uh, Seattle, Boise had it for a while. I, I assume they still do. But when you call the city and they put you on hold, hi, city of Boise, please hold, you listen to only local musicians playing. And, um, uh, and then, uh, and they change the music every quarter, you know, every three months, but it's a way to promote the local music industry. And it was so popular in Seattle that the mayor back then, Mayor Mike McGinn, did the voiceovers. Hi, this is Mayor Mike McGinn. You're listening to Seattle Music on Hold. Here's the website. Buy this music. Now, the city already invested millions of dollars in the phone system, right? This was a coordinator level person, uh, you know, at the, uh, at the Arts Council. One of the big public... Um, Safety issues these days, people stealing manhole covers uh, and selling them for scrap metal. You know, that's the call you don't want in the middle of the night, right? Can't find the manhole. The lady fell in. We can't get her out. Um, and so uh, I, I was up in upstate New York where they were having this issue. And, you know, they got now they got to go back to the foundry, have new ones made with little locks on them. Well, they had artists design the tops of them. And these are a couple from across the country. Um, but, you know, cities lose thousands of manhole covers in a year and have to replace them. And for an extra thousand bucks, they paid the artist, uh, created the mold and whatever so they could cast them. And as the city managers was taking me through town, there's our new bank. We renovated the theater. Oh, here's another one of our manhole covers. Again, you got to make them anyway, right? Um, 
And so, uh, actually, before I get there, um, uh, the Phoenix Dump, uh, the 27th uh, Avenue Solid Waste Treatment Facility in, in Phoenix, Arizona. Um, how do we make this dump, you know, a better place for the people who work here, help our uh, community better understand their, their ecological footprint? They brought in artists to be part of the design team and, and to build it. And, you know, for years, the Phoenix Dump has been wrote the, a site for rotating art exhibits. 250,000 people a year sometimes go to see the rotating art exhibits at the dump. Um, the way to think about this is every municipality has got advisory boards, commissions, you know, one for airports, one for signage, one for roads, right? It's all the ways we engage the citizenry. And so my question always is, do you have artists and arts organizations as part of that? You know, are they are, are they um, bringing those kind of creative, artful solutions to work that's got to be done anyway? The artists just make good decisions, better decisions. So I, let me wrap up here this last piece. So, and um, this is just uh, you know one of these other benefits. I think it's so relevant now. You know this such challenging times in our community. I mean, things were fractious before COVID, but now we've got distancing and isolation. And, you know, when it's time to, there will be another side to this. We will get to the other side of the pandemic. You know, the arts are going to be part of the solution uh, here. Um, economically, right? The arts, they get us out of our homes uh, and into the community and frequenting local businesses. Remember that $31.47 figure. Um, it's, you know, 70% of the economy is consumer expenditures, right? And so this, this is getting local spending going. And then connecting us, you know, our experiences are shared experiences in public spaces, whether it's like, hey, we're doing a community mural or it's a open air festival or we're all seeing Hamilton for the third time. And people don't care who you voted for or where you practice your faith. It's something we do together. The public gets this as well. 72% of the public says the arts unify our communities, regardless of age, race or ethnicity. 73%. The arts help me understand other cultures in my community, right? You know, we're all really dealing, right, with this upheaval and uh, and how do we how do we get people working together and connecting again? And again, you know, there's the arts. Um, and 81% of the population says the arts are a positive experience in a troubled world. People really need it. People really get it. So, um, this is a picture from Paris, 1913, at the Louvre. Bad news, the Mona Lisa got stolen. Um, and those hooks are where the Mona Lisa had been hanging. Uh, but it, and it took them two years to get the painting back. But in the two years the Mona Lisa was gone, more people went to see where the painting had been hanging, these empty hooks, than saw the painting itself in the previous 14 years. It's really easy to take the arts for granted and assume they're always gonna be there. Uh, and so I hope everybody you know, thinks about the arts, not as a frill or an extra, but as an industry, as one we should be partnering with, uh, supporting, patronizing and really a strategy uh, to the region's economic development and business attraction. So thank you um, for letting me be with you. Um, thank you for everything you do to uh, advance the arts in the community. And um, it's important and you're important for doing it. So thanks very much. And I'll pass it back to Warren and our host and we can have some conversation. Warren, I think I'm missing you on mute. Warren, I think you're muted. Oh, well, sorry about that, everyone. I was muted. My apologies. Uh, Aunt Randy, what I was saying, thank you very much for your, uh, your, your comments and your presentation today. Some great stuff for us to think about and work at as a community. I would like you to, to stay on the screen with us today as we invite the audience to participate in the Q&A portion of this event. Absolutely. And I believe we have some questions coming in already, so let me get to those. And I'll just uh, read the questions for you, Randy, and then you can please uh, please take it in the direction. So the first of these uh, actually comes from Mary Gillette, who's on the, the, the Arts Council here. Our arts community is so 
disengaged with the business community, the community leaders and funders. Suggested strategies to connect better so that we're seen as a viable partner and not an unfunded luxury. Mary getting right to the point there. Yeah. Hi, Mary. Um, and great question. Uh, you know, <laughs> the arts community has to, ha they have to step up and be part of that. Uh, and of course, the other side of that is, you know, the business community needs to be open and welcoming to that. Um, I travel, you know, I speak to 25 chambers of commerce a year. And uh, in the last 20 years, you know, I used to see no arts organizations uh, as part of that. But now, um, you know, the arts arts organizations are really are engaging. Uh, and um, we all need to be partners in prosperity. We all need to think of uh, community partnerships, whether it's with a local business or education or the hospital. Um, you know, I believe if you want to integrate the arts deeply into community and have a creative, uh, rich community, I mean, everybody needs to step up to that plate. Uh, hopefully the artists and arts organizations um, you know, would see the benefit of that. Uh, the benefit is more opportunities, public art programs, uh, you know, funding for your arts organizations, because it's about building relevance uh, and being relevant to the community. Um, but part of that means we've got a job to do. We can't, you know, just, you know, sit in the garret uh, and, and, uh, and and hide out up there. Um, I think, you know, it seems to me most places I go, you know, most folks get it and it's, it's yeah, it's one more thing we've all got to do, uh, but it's, it's definitely part of doing business. It's definitely being part of a, a, a vital industry. So um, I hope the arts community, so, you know, increase perceived value. I uh, hope there were some artists and arts organizations on this call so they can understand that there's powerful research uh, that shows they're advancing the community. Um, health, education, business development, you know, economic prosperity. Um, not sure how else to answer that, uh, but Hope that helps. Well, thank you. So the next one we have is here is, how can we best persuade our local legislators to support the arts and expand funding to cultural and arts programming programming in the region? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and funding is so important to the arts organizations. You know, nationally, um, uh, about 60% of an arts organization's uh, revenue comes from uh, ticket sales, sponsorships, sales, that type of thing. 30% uh, from private contributions, individuals, foundations, corporations, 10% from governments, I think 60, 30, 10. Everyone's mileage varies, you know, museums are different for performing arts organizations. But um, the reason for that is, as nonprofit organizations, you know, we've got an obligation to make our cultural product accessible to the community. And one of the accessibility uh, barriers is cost and affordability. Um, you know, how much does it cost to go see Hamilton? You know, it's like hundreds of dollars. Well, that's what it takes to pay all the bills for a production. And so, but who can afford that? So, you know, you got to bring those costs down and that's the importance uh, of the contributed support from government and um, uh, from the private sector. I, I think it's in, um, part of it is articulating all the community benefits um, that we talked about. Uh, and it's going to those uh, elected leaders and, and doing your homework and seeing what's important to them. Um, is it education? Is it the economy? Uh, is it healthcare? And connect, like we just did today, connect the arts to those priorities. There's research that underscores all of that. Um, I've got a golden rule at Americans for the Arts. No numbers without a story, no stories without a number. You know, arts are full of stories. We've got great stories of, you know, something that, you know, benefited a young person or an older person or the community or, um, you know, how all the restaurants have been closed since the Performing Arts Center went dark because of COVID. Um, and then we've got these numbers to really um, bring that point home. So uh, uh, use the data and advocate and tell your story. And I just sort of kind of three advocacy type of questions. Sometimes I was, well, all right, Andy, you say advocate. How do you do that? And you know, there's libraries full of how to be a good advocate. But three questions. What's the message? Who gets the message? Who delivers the message? Um, 
Boy, we talked about a whole bunch of messages today, right? I keep enumerating them. Jobs, the economy, you know, quality of life, workforce attraction, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I um, have, uh, and I can make this available to Warren and the team, and they can redistribute. Ten reasons to support the arts. It's all just a handy one pager there. Uh, we'll make sure everyone has access to that. It's also on the Americans for the Arts website. Um, one pager, right? You know, there's your cheat sheet. Uh, all the reasons to support the arts. Question two, who gets the message? That's where we do our homework. Who's the decision maker? If it's a, uh, you know, if it's the state legislature, you know, um, which legislators are overseeing the arts funding and what's that committee and who's on that committee and what's important to those people? Um, and then uh, lead with that argument. And then the third um, question, uh, who delivers the message? You know, we're the usual suspects in the arts, you know, when they parade me up to Capitol Hill, you know, they, everyone knows what that's about, right? You know, guys cover up their wallets, the ladies, you know, lock their purse in their drawer. You know, it's like, this guy's here to pick our pockets. Um, but that's why we bring um, others uh, as well. So I'll give you an example. Um, Mesa, Arizona, um, the mayor was uh, giving a talk at one of the Republican mayor talking at one of our events, and he was saying, you know, it was budget hearing night and uh, for the arts. Uh, and so it was me, the mayor, the city council, 60 people lined up to do their three minutes. And, uh, and he said, you know, the chief of police was there that night, which wasn't too unusual, except he was in full chief of police regalia, hat, tie, medals, which was a little different. And... After everybody else had um, offered their three minutes, he asked for three minutes uh, to talk on behalf of the arts. And he basically said, you know, if you have to make a cut out of the arts and culture budget, I'd just rather you cut it out of my public safety budget. Because when they do their job well, it makes my job easier. Man, can you imagine if we had a thousand police chiefs on that message? So who delivers the message? It could be our neighbors. It could be our boards. You know, the hospital CEO should be looking at those data and like, oh, my gosh, you know, this is making us a more competitive hospital. Yeah, I'll get in there and rally for you as well. So that's, that's uh, how to answer that. Another one here. Can you speak to AFTA's proposal to put creative worker, creative view workers back to work post pandemic? Yeah, so um, the pandemic has really been devastating. COVID-19 has been devastating on the arts. Uh, we've got, I've got several large national tracking studies on the human and financial impacts. 63% of uh, artists and creative workers fully unemployed, 95% of lost income. Uh, they're averaging a $20,000, $22,000 loss per year in creativity income. Arts organizations, effectively all of them, have had to make some cancellations. They're down, by our estimates, $13.1 billion so far uh, and have lost 355 million admissions. It's been rough. And you know, there's more, more bad news where that came from. Um, and so we've been uh, using those data. This gets back to one of the earlier questions. Data Research is clout in advocacy, you know. Think of the research as clout. And so we've been using those data, ours, Brookings institutions, in um, working with the uh, federal uh, government and Congress. And so um, arts organizations have been eligible for the PPP loans, um, nonprofit arts organizations, 10,000 of them got $1.8 billion, um, you know, out of – $500 billion. Um, and uh, federal uh, pandemic unemployment insurance, you know, we made sure the artists were eligible for that. Uh, so we're working with um, Congress, we're working with the president, we're working with candidate Biden uh, to make sure they understand that um, artists are an important part of the workforce and that there's a long history here, whether it's CETA or the WPA going way back um, and making sure they understand uh, that it's a jobs industry and a lot of the benefits we talked about today. You know, this is going to be good for the economy as well. Great. Thanks very much. The next here is how can we support a more vibrant community by encouraging diversity in the arts, especially in our region here, Traverse City, which is somewhat lacking uh, voices of color in the art sector. Mm -hmm. um, well, uh, I think um, giving, 
giving voice to those uh, the voices and ensure um, uh, that there's uh, there's opportunities. Arts organizations uh, have been. Um, uh, about a third of arts organizations um, during the pandemic uh, have been doing some kind of work to uh, uh, connect and, and, and reach out to their entire community. Um, uh, let's see, I'm just I'm thinking of strategies here. Um, but it, it actually it goes it goes with the funders it goes with the, with the practice but to a more vibrant arts community it's it's got to reach out uh to all segments uh, of the community and there's even good reason for this too travelers these days tourism research and this will be again you know the case after uh we get through you know that when the travel restrictions are lifted um Tourists these days are looking for authentic cultural experiences. They want to go to a community and learn about its history, its diversity, who lives there, what people do, um, where is the vitality, um, what's going on in the neighborhoods, uh, and what what are those um, art forms. Uh, uh, and so. Um, we need to make sure that uh, we don't just focus on the big major institutions, uh, but in fact, cut across you know the entire spectrum uh, of the local creative economy. So, um, making sure those folks are part of the fold, part of the conversation. It's opening up the table. It's sharing power and resources. Um, but diversity, equity, inclusion, I think, is uh, obviously going to be vital, um, a vital economic development strategy, you know, for the community and region as well. Um, we're hearing more and more uh, from businesses about um, embracing uh, diversity uh, and ensuring that everybody who works for their companies, you know, feels that they are in uh, a welcoming uh, environment where diversity and equity inclusion are a value. Thank you. Randy, the next question. How can we communicate to human resource leaders and companies hiring that the creative mind is very often best suited, suited excuse me, to C-suite level positions? It seems there may be a disconnect here. Yeah, that's that's definitely one of the challenges. Um, you know, I. But you've got that research from the conference board, uh, for example. You know, that's business scholars writing for business leaders. Um, there's the Department of Agriculture's uh, research that shows uh, two out of three business leaders in rural communities um, uh, are prioritizing uh, arts and um, entertainment as a way to attract workforce. Um, so we got to be educating, you know, bottom up, top down. Um, and so who are the business leaders in the community now that get that? Um, and you know, can they be uh, important spokespeople to uh, other other members of the business community? Um, so, and there's a lot of education, uh, a lot of leadership education that needs to happen. So I'd use the research we had we talked about today. Yeah. From Rick Coates, we have a question here. Please share some suggestions on creating cultural tourism initiatives. Mm -hmm. um, so is uh, and this in a way you know, is, is similar kind of messaging and content to the uh, issue for HR professionals. Um, and, oh, and you know, the other thing is for HR professionals, uh, they need to have a good understanding of what their local cultural assets are, uh, because, you know, they need to be selling their community. And it's the same, um, you know, with tourism. Uh, over half of arts councils, local arts agencies, um, organizations like Mary's, partner with their CVBs um, and uh, make sure that that's what's being marketed. And this gets back to what the point I was just talking about, the traveler, domestic traveler, international traveler, looking for arts and cultural uh, authentic experiences, right? People are looking to create memories. How do you know that, you know, they get out the camera? And, you know, how, what, how do you build a memory? Through an experience. And that's the arts. Um, and so uh, are we are we marketing that? Um, are we pushing that out? Also, uh, there can be, so there's like big initiatives, but then there was those examples I gave of, you know, are we making sure that everything that our government does or all of our, you know, sort of community decisions have a business, um, I'm sorry, have a, an arts approach to them. You know, if you're if you're making, you know, if you're doing a new dump, if you're doing new uh, uh, manhole covers, 
what can we do to make that a, a, a vibrant cultural asset? Because, you know, we're doing most of the work uh, there uh, already. Um, you know, I remember uh, Lexington, this is some years ago, uh, was doing a public art initiative where um, they were, you know, like, uh, you know, you may have heard like Chicago, they did, you know, the bulls and uh, like, a, you know, with a bull or Lexington did horses where they, you know, basically take a plaster, you know, um, piece of a animal or a something and then an individual artist you know artists paint those and they move them and spread them out around town and uh they're wonderful very popular um visual arts uh, uh pieces well lexington did about 75 of them and lexington very segregated city but they spread the art uh, the horses throughout the whole city and then the paper did this newspaper did this thing where um get your picture, take a picture next to all 75 horses and we'll put your picture in the newspaper. And that became like this thing. Uh, and the locals, you know, people crossed into air parts of the community they'd never been in before. Um, so it had a real unifying thing, but also, you know, the story got out, drew a lot of attention. A lot of people came to uh, see the art. So it's, it's uh, marketing. Um, remember 69% of arts attendees uh, who travel to uh, a different community do so because of the arts. So, you know, create that product that's going to uh, attract folks. But again, it's a lot of partnerships too. And it's, you know, back to an earlier question, um, you know, if it's the museum um, I, or a historic home, I mean, I, I, you know, go and see some of these historic homes or something, you know, that are open, you know, two afternoons a week and then a morning. Well, if you're trying to market, you know, Traverse region, yeah, like, look, I need you guys to be open five days a week, you know, uh, during the day and I need a place to put a bus. And so, Build those partnerships. What are our creative opportunities? Get the word out. Um, yeah. Great, thank you. And our final question today, as artists, we realize the value of the data. Is your data available for us to use to promote the arts? Absolutely. Boy, I love that. What a perfect last question. Yes, <laughs> be great using that. Um, so americansforthearts.org is our, uh, um, uh, is our organization's website and we've got everything I talked about is is there um, and uh, you can email me uh, you know just go ahead and email me I put it on the last slide there but um, R. Cohen R-C-O-H-E-N at A-R-T-S U-S-A dot org arts U-S-A dot org so uh, yeah oh good thanks Molly um, yeah, just shoot me an email. It's like, what was that thing about uh, education? Or what was that thing about, you know, uh, uh, 21st century workforce and the conference board? I'll get it to you. Um, and again, also make sure we make that available, um, that one pager, 10 reasons to support the arts available. You know, just put that in your wallet and keep it there. You know, that's like a Swiss army knife for advocacy. Um, and make sure you always tell a story as well. So uh, the golden rule. Great. Well, thank you, Randy. That about does it for our time today. I want to, first of all, thank you, our keynote speaker, for joining us and for providing great content and answering the questions. And thanks again to all of our attendees as well for joining us and, to particip and for participating in today's event. Of course, our great appreciation to our sponsors, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan, Munson Healthcare, and the Michigan Film and Digital Media Office, as well as our Northwest Michigan Arts and Cultural Network. And of course, once again, thank you to all, all of you, our members and our investor companies. Your support drives these efforts forward.